everyone and welcome to the first episode of Learning Legacy, uh, a series where effectively we talk about legacy with the view of improving your game and learning about what it is to play legacy in a bit more detail in a kind of fun and entertaining way. Um, so it's going to be very exciting. Today we're going to be talking about sideboard guides and basically taking the deck that we played last week, uh, which is the Aluren video, which I hope you've watched and given some feedback on, and basically talking about how do you sideboard, what's the purpose, it, what the purposes are, overall matchups and kind of going from there. So let's uh, cut to uh, my co-host and good friend Sarah. Sarah, what we're we talking about today? Hi, Sahar. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so as Sahar said, we're quickly going to be going over what a sideboard guide is, um, what the benefits are of writing out your own sideboard guides, and hopefully also showing you that it's a lot easier than you might think. Um, we're going to be following kind of a simple three-step process, which is to build the guide, to compare our guide to someone else's sideboard guide and then to kind of discuss the differences and we're going to go into detail about how each of these steps really help your understanding of the deck you're playing and also just improve your gameplay overall. Um, as Sahar said, today we're going to be specifically going over the deck list we played last week. So if that video excited you, if you're excited about the chance of playing Aloran, I really recommend just following along at home. All the documents you'll need will be in the description, and it's a really good process and you really will get a lot of benefit out of it. Exactly. It's a, it's a process I've been following for many, many years, and for us it's just a way of showing to you, the viewer at home, that... Uh, it's legacy is also about learning, which is kind of very on the nose of learning legacy as the title for the series. So for people who uh, want a bit of a refresher on what we played, this is what we played. Um, this is a good friend of ours, Stuart. Um, we played a bug version of Aluren, um, which if you don't know is, is a combo deck centered around this four mana enchantment. Um, and you have combo potentials with Asarak, uh, Cavern Harpy, and uh, Oro, and things like that. So um, the, the, we, we went okay, uh, as okay as it can be. Um, but today is more about just learning about how we fit into the wider ecosystem of the wider legacy format and how can we effectively you know sideboard against some of our best matches and where do we fit into the wider ecosystem that is the legacy format so the first thing i normally do and i'm sure some of you at home who've been playing legacy a while uh will may do is go on to a deck sort of aggregate website to find the meta game and for me personally mtg goldfish is the best one um, mtg top eight is also good but i f i like the way that goldfish breaks everything down you have the picture of the deck what the top cards are its meta share the colors that it is um and sort of going from there so we're gonna today we're gonna look at reanimator and we're gonna look at delver and actually um some of these will come in, you know, some of these uh, we can go into, but one deck I also want to highlight because uh, we have a combo deck, a sort of tempo deck, and then a Jeskai Stoneblade as a kind of control deck, which is basically where control is going with things like Staff the Storyteller. So I think without further ado, Sarah, let's let's crack into the, let's crack into the big baddie of the format, which is currently Reanimator. Um, it's, oh, it's a hell of a drug. Um, it's a hell of a drug. Um, the one thing that Reanimator um, right now is the reason why it's very good is I think there's not a lot of graveyard hate, and I think the combination of something like Grief and Reanimate to effectively take two cards out of opponent's hand and then reanimate, you know, and reanimate it in that sense is actually really powerful. And I think a lot of decks are trying to do that in this space. You have things like Atraxa to draw you cards. You have the original big Grizzle Daddy uh, with Grizzle Brand to draw you a load of cards. Uh, Archon of Cruelty for a bit more like interaction um, and obviously Grief to kind of do that. And then you have a bunch of ways of, you know, re you know putting it stuff into the graveyard, Faithless Dooting in two, and then reanimating it uh, with Exhume or Namesake Reanimate and then discard to stop your opponent playing magic. Um, yeah. It's very yeah. all-in. <laughs> yeah, it is extremely all-in. So we're going straight into step one, which is where we build our own sideboard guide. Mm -hmm. And what's very important as you're doing this is not to get too caught up on your ideas being correct. 
We yeah. simply just want to get down on paper kind of how you think about the matchup and what your ideas are. Because mm -hmm. then when you compare it against someone who's much more experienced, you have a really honest idea of where you might be lacking understanding or that kind of thing. Yeah. If you just get too caught up on like the decision paralysis of, oh, should it be this, should it be that? You're going to spend way more time than you really need to. It's more important to just make sure you're engaging with the topic and getting something down. Uh, so, as Sahar said, uh, we've got this really all-in combo deck. We have to think, how does that line up against what our, what our deck is doing? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Reanimate is a hell of a, hell of a deck it's... to start with. But it's it is the baddie of the format, and I think that it is something where I think that one thing that we have advantage of, um, and I think a lot of blue decks have advantage of, is you have force of will. Um, the fact of the matter is that in our deck we have force of wills um, as a way of stopping, um, you know, the first you know the first go effectively and we have force negation in our sideboards to stop them as well as our own um potential fault seizes or anything like that although you don't really want to fault seize them too much but you can stop their action so i think with reanimator one of the major things to be kind of leveraging effectively is the counter spells um you have you have a few you have not so many of them but what you have is very powerful so i think we need to leverage the power of um force of will force of negation because your opponent is trying to kill you on turn one turn two so if yeah. i think you, you weathered the storm then i think you are fine to keep going because you're also a combo deck so you can actually you know kill your opponent you know with by turn four but you have to effectively get to turn four uh, yeah. So I think leveraging your counter magic is quite good. Weirdly, Minor Misstep is one of these cards that, as much as we were a bit unsure why it's here, weirdly it's kind of good here uh, against Reanimator because it basically hits a good chunk of the deck. It hits all the way. It, the only things it doesn't hit is Exhum and uh, Unmask and Animate Dead. Um, it also... Um, uh, it doesn't stop show and tell, but I'm not sure if they would bring in the show and tell pack package against us um, as a way of kind of dealing with like pyroblast or like graveyard hate because we don't actually have much in the way of like quote unquote graveyard hate. Um, endure obviously endurance is like you know main day graveyard hate, so that is actually very powerful. Also, we leverage endurance as well as a way of stopping. Um, you know, we have that we have the power that is endurance. So I think having uh endurance your i'm not saying we're mulliganing to endurance but we are very much hoping to have endurance in our opening hand so if our opponent does go for turn one we have that interaction to stop it being yeah. done so i think endurance is a key card here yeah so i think we kind of both take slightly different approaches to this but yeah. they're both valid you're kind of focusing on which cards are going to be the most impactful in mm. the deck Whereas generally what I would the way I would write this is so opponent is a very fast all in combo graveyard deck. Therefore we want to play kind of the control role. Yeah. Right? Yes. Their combo is much quicker than ours. Um, it can just shut us down before we get to ours. Yeah. So we want to bring in as much disruption as is viable. Mm -hmm. And we want to just keep them off. Because, you know, Reanimator is one of those decks where if you get rid of enough of that action, they're sometimes just drawing like Lotus Petal, Lotus Petal, um, reanimate when they've got nothing in the graveyard. You know, yeah. they need that A plus B. And if we can like properly just disrupt, 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 yeah. then suddenly Alaren win the game. Um, it's very, very effective. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree as well. I think that disruption here is the the gold. Um, point because we are effectively the control deck here. Um, mm -hmm. If we if we're kind of doing the con you know who is the beat down who is not the beat down they are the beat down here they are trying to kill you as humanly po quickly as humanly possible uh, by doing that. So saying that though is what did they what they could bring it. I think they are still trying to. I don't think they're probably as all in on the grief animate kind of like turn one just just uh, shred your hand but maybe they might do. Um, 
But I am conscious that, you know, if we take this particular list, for example, which won the prelim this week, um, you know, they've got things like Serenity to stop us doing it. Some people are running like wear tear to stop like Alluren to kind of do that. But I think for them, their goal is to just go as fast as possible and sort of not disregard what we're doing, but just at least go, you know what? I don't really have much for this matchup. I just kind of go. Um, and perhaps they bring in something like show and tell. I doubt it because we have things that we can also bring in because our creatures are also just as good. Uh, but I think they just want to, you know, reanimate a grizzle brand as quickly as possible, draw a bunch of cards, then reanimate something else and then do it again effectively. So, for, yeah. so what are we bringing? So in that question then is what are we either bringing in or cutting to make space? My first... Yeah. My first so, thing is get this snuff out of my deck. <laughs> get yeah. this, get so, this snuff out out. <laughs> to do it in a like very structured kind of way to make it easier for people who haven't done this kind of thing before. Yep. So you want to start by doing what we've done, which is you look at your opponent's deck, kind of think about how your deck works, and just be like, okay, so now I have like a general idea of what my plan is going to be. Mm -hmm. And then move to looking at your deck and actually the specific cards. Yeah. So because uh, if you don't have like a plan, you're kind of just staring at cards, wondering which ones are better than others. Don't tell which them. Is... Don't tell them what I do at tournaments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's I've... very difficult to like create an effective sideboard plan if you don't have the plan. But yeah, basically, a hundred percent. 100% and this is something I tell a lot of players both new and existing is that you need a plan and I I personally always will try to make some time uh, at a minimum level um, you know whether I'm traveling you know if you have a bit of downtime I typically like actually write you know similar to kind of either typing it out like we're doing now or writing it out but just having a plan you've you've had a methodical approach um and demonstrating the methods of improvement and i think taking a lot one thing about sideboarding actually i want to mention at the start before we get into the plan itself is you're taking a lot of the brain power that you would have in game and trying to front load that so when you're in the game you're not thinking about oh i need to do this i need to do that you've already done a lot of that work already which i think is super useful when especially when you're in a seven eight nine ten round player tournament oh god so yep. i've just come back from italy and it's a uh, nine rounds was a lot um yep. so yeah so that so we've looked at opponent's deck opponent is doing something similar i think actually i will also bring up smoopy magic um also look at one thing with goldfish i quite like is that you have these similar decks so reanimator hasn't really changed that much over the over like the recent periods but you also want to see what um other variations of a deck that can be we can come to this when we get onto uh the the old big baddie that is delver but i always like looking at maybe like a two, a couple of decks just to see a difference and snoopy magic is probably one of the more well-known magic online players who plays reanimator um and it's interesting to see that when you look at snoopy magic compared to this anonymous one um they're running doffy voidwalker and they're running shieldreds and they're running magus of the moon so for them they are trying to and their own snuff outs so this is more about recognizing that graveyard hate will be brought in so how do we counteract the graveyard hate so it's why we play things like doffy voidwalker which we can still cast without having to worry about making you know uh you know using our dark rituals as a way of casting our spells rather than just reanimating like a grizzle brand or an archon or things like that so yeah. look at a couple of variations as well when you are planning what your opponent might be because you might be caught out if you're planning for one deck and then you see something else and you're like oh i didn't expect that so be mindful of that when you're playing so i always just like looking at just a couple of decks so you can see here this opponent is looking at more trying to play more fatties and are trying to you know either disrupt their opponents or color hose them entirely in this case and do the show and tell plan so disregard graveyard hate and go you know what i'm just going to put the show and tell thing in whereas someone like stupid magic is like actually i want to still play a semi-fair game 
just casting my spells, use my Lotus Petals for mana, and cast like Doffy Void Walker and Shieldreds and, you know, things like Magus of the Moon against like lands or, you know, greedy mana based decks or something like that. So it's a slightly different thing. Uh, obviously, Fairy Macabre is kind of for the mirror and other graveyard decks as well. So just be mindful of that. So when we look at now we've looked at other people's now looking at our own going okay what's what's useful what's not useful what what card is kind of mvp as we can kind of call it so obviously i've highlighted endurance i've highlighted the forces um i'm trying to think what else is kind of in our main deck i think in our main deck i think most of these cards have good value it's just a case of what you cut um, yeah. So with that, it's the kind of thing where working out your plan makes that much easier. Um, because we know in this matchup we want to be disruptive and then combo, we can kind of decide, okay, so we don't really want to trim our combo because we want to play like the unfair game. Mm -hmm. The fair game can be too slow. We might run out of disruption and give our opponent a chance to get in. Yeah. So in a lot of matchups, you'll find yourself trimming the Alloran combo. Mm. But since we're kind of deciding to be more combo focused to back up a disruption, it immediately tells us, okay, don't trim the combo. Look at the other cards. Yeah. Right. Um, so the first one, as you correctly pointed out, is snuff out. Yeah. It just doesn't line up against our opponent's threats. Almost all of our opponent's threats are black cards. Yeah. And the only one that isn't is like Sarah's emissary, yeah, and things like that. But you really, this card doesn't do much in no. the matchup at all. Um, so that's an easy couple cuts yeah. for us. Um, um, and then also it's worth looking at like what you want to bring in, so you know how much you have to cut as yeah. well. So I'm just gonna put I'm just gonna put snuff out. Sorry, let me show snuff out here. It's just so I know that I've got it. So snuff out's obviously an obviously choice. Uh, also, yeah, bringing in. So let's look at bringing in. So I would say for me, my initial gut would be to bring in to th these force negations, um, just so you can have a uh, interactive way of dealing with something turn one, turn two, uh, especially on the draw. Um, this is kind of a matchup where being like any any sort of fast combo matchup being on the draw is kind of you know brutal effectively but we, but we have these forces you can then do that um then it's interesting because then you're kind of looking at well what's valuable because then you like your carpets is obviously not for them hydro blast is not for them you can see a world where you have forties, but i think that's like a double-edged sword because as much as you want to disrupt them this is kind of not for them abrupt decay doesn't really kill anything um unless you're worried about them bringing in if like if we take like the snoopy magic sideboard for example for reanimator if you're concerned about them bringing smaller creatures um then maybe but this also doesn't kill grief so even if they try to yeah. reanimate grief that's not good the only thing it really does kill is the actual animate dead itself yeah. which is text in the matchup but it's not like the most useful yeah. piece so i think honestly my initial gut just from a straight swap in swap out is take these snuff outs out and put the force negations in that's like an easy for me that is a, that is a take out removal put in counter magic it's sometimes you know these combo decks can do that these blue based combo decks can do that we're like we'll take out some of the interactive stuff put more permission and we can then do that so i think that's a for me an easy uh plus minus so i'll just add this so the only bit where I want to question is obviously yep. we have three abrupt decay yes. in the in the deck. Yes. And this isn't as clear cut, but there is kind of the question of, well, is it worth doing a straight swap of those for Fort Seize? Because yeah. yes, Fort Seizing the big creature does nothing, but Fort Seizing the reanimate spell is often very good. But of course it is risky. Like if you play a Fort Seize and you see a hand where the only thing you can choose is the big thing, you're just helping your opponent. Oh, it's so bad. But, but I feel like that's usually very unlikely in the mm. early game. Yeah. Um, I yeah. am leaning towards Fort Seas, and I'll tell you for why. Because mm -hmm. if because we don't have quote-unquote, you know, fairy macabres or Leila and the boys, we have endurance. Like, endurance is our friend here. Um we can afford to you know we can keep a bit more of an interactive hand of like fort sees something if we have to hit a fatty let them go off you can endurance in response 
um, mm. and sort of you you bring in forties with the view of like this has to complement something else I'm also doing. Whether that's a counter spell, whether that's you playing your own counter spells, whether that's you playing your own endurance, um, or uh, you're about to also combo off. So they say you've got to turn three or four. Um, and you can do that. The thing that we don't necessarily have that other decks have is the quote unquote stopping them doing their thing. Um, you know, it's not like something where take something like Leyline Void, for example, when you play Leyline Void, which is a uh, which is a sort of exile whenever whenever a card goes into a graveyard, exile it uh, effect. Um, so you don't have that. So you, if you're bringing in Fortsies, you are planning to play Fortsies. Um, a little bit more deliberately rather than just firing it off um there is a whole thing about how to fort seize properly we don't have time for that today just there's a lot on google about how to fort seize properly so i would probably bring in fort seize um for these abrupt decays if we see things like doffy void walker and uh magus of the moon or like something where they're, they're playing more low to the ground creatures like doffy void walker is the main one um then i might be tempted to bring maybe bring in like an abrupt decay or two back in but honestly i think um permission and disruption is is key here uh but i think Fortsy is sarah's completely correct it's a double-edged sword but i think it's a double-edged sword that we can utilize to our advantage and not just fire it off and then go, oh, I've just helped my opponent reanimate their best spell or something like that. So, yeah. I think... Anything that's really close, like this discussion where we're talking about Fort Seas versus Abrupt Decay, mm -hmm. um, again, don't worry about whether you're correct or not. Yeah. Make notes about your thought process. So then when you come to compare it against a higher level player's whiteboard guide you've got something to check up on yeah. you can see oh they agree my gut instinct was correct and you can reinforce that kind of thinking or they might disagree and then you can start trying to think about why yeah. it's important in this entire process that you just remain humble and remain honest and you just do your best and even if you're just completely wrong you're gonna learn so much from that that I think it's completely worth it. You just need to be prepared to, you know, learn, which is the whole point of this. <laughs> Learning legacy, folks, is the whole point of the series. And I think that's so important, especially, you know, a lot of players who are watching this are probably, uh, have picked up sideboards, you know, a lot of people, you know, sell sideboards and like do whatever. But I think that when you do this exercise yourself, and you trust your own gut. Honestly, a lot of it is like, I mean, me and Sarah have, uh, you know, uh, similar but slightly different, you know, philosophies on this of like, stay humble, learn. If you make, if you notice that you bring a card in and it's not impactful, make a note, just go like, I think this card wasn't as impactful. And then you write it down and then you consult either yourself or you consult others in the community and you go, actually, I didn't think this card was useful. And then I go, oh, this may not is for this. Maybe you can use this on the draw or maybe you could do this in something else. I think that's an important discussion to have. So I think for the purposes of the reanimator matchup based on our deck, uh, another thing we can also leverage here, um, this is more just how you play when you're thinking about sideboarding, um, and in terms of impactful cards, as I said, which is obviously things like endurance, things like the uh, the uh, the permission. Um, I think also just being mindful that I know this is going to sound really contrived, but baleful strix and ice fan quattle occasionally will block <laughs> if you need to block an attractor or block an archon uh i mean if you get to that point you're probably dying anyway but like you know sometimes you'll get to that point where they just block and then you're like oh uh you know they'll draw the cards and sometimes they just draw hot air that sometimes happens to reanimate it you you'll they'll have the games where they have the nut and that's amazing and then they'll have the game where they have actually stone cold nothing and they've drawn all fat all the big creatures and none of the payoff and they draw all the payoff and none of the creatures you know every deck has its own variants so i think that with that i think these are the main things i would add in obviously if you have any thoughts yourselves please add into the comments below but i think i'm happy with the reanimator much it's sometimes you don't have to change much because i think you're because our deck is probably set up quite nicely to play against reanimator you don't need to like completely like 
what's known as like in the old days like a transformational sideboard where you basically 15 cards in 15 cards out and completely change the makeup of your deck something like reanimator our deck is already set up so much to like have a you know a combo finish where it's fake like a re release valve and we can like play our spells and we go born with de your dead um but also we can have the early disruption to stop our opponent doing their thing as well and i think if we i genuinely believe that if we go past like turn four or five i think we're winning the long game whereas i think reanimator is more favored turn one to something like say three i don't know what you think sarah on that yeah it's very much just having the disruption to get through those early like waves of just all-in pressure um and then generally speaking we're quite good in the long game yeah um we will eventually draw our combo and kind of just go off they can't benefit really from our Alarin at all no. um so yeah like it's very much just survive 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 win the game eventually is the kind of plan that we're going in with legacy is starting to sound a lot like that recently <laughs> just like yeah. survive 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 then you can win the game so i think yeah so i think reanimator even though it's a big baddie of the format right now uh it's very powerful um but just be cognizant of that we, we don't have the advantage of playing white um with rookings like source of plowshares so i think we just have to you know uh, do the old-fashioned like you know disruptive element of it as well um and i think those i think those are the key things uh, again all this stuff is very good and things like that oh sarah's emissary oh love that mm -hmm. uh right so that's reanimator so i think we go in we got our you know our over idea and then we've got our sideboard plan very simple right now let's go back to the original baddie of the format which is is it delver I mean, we can also put Team of Delver while we're here as well. We can put both Delvers here. Yeah, I think our plan will be similar yeah. for both. <laughs> just put Grixis Delver. Just put, just put all flavours of Delver here while we're here. So Delver is... Uh, so if you don't know uh, what Delver is in terms of uh, legacy, uh, <laughs> it is a proactive, uh, typically base blue-red deck that utilizes things like days wasteland and the aforementioned delver of secrets this beautiful creature from i want to say innistrad um to effectively just the old saying was that tempo your opponent out and i think tempo is a controversial term but basically trying to use um you know the best cantrips in the format so your best draw card draw source in brainstorm in ponder um you have permission in terms of spell pierce days and force of will and pyroblast to a certain extent you have some removal mistress ball to draw you more cards this is a uh, this is a bit of a spicy include right now uh, as a nod to uh Delva being particularly bad against control decks, so one main deck maddening hex um, is something to be mindful of. Um, and I'm so strong right now, I'm a big fan of, so I would probably look at something like this. There are other variations. One thing about the Delva matchup right now to be mindful of is that Delva is in a. Um, the reason why we brought up, like, is it Tima and Grixis, is that. And this is more. This is actually more Death Shadow, but. Um, the Delver po so if if you're sort of new to playing Legacy, uh, I want to say March, uh, there was a ban to expressive iteration and white plume enter rest in peace white plume, um, and the source of card advantage that Delver had for what effectively years has now since disappeared. So now there is a I don't want to say a schism, but there is different factions and variations on how Delver could and should be built uh people are innovating new cards trying different things um so when you play against delver as much as the shell of these 12 creatures so delver seekers dragon ray charm and merc type region are here and the suite of removal and lands this is like the i would call this probably the, the, the closest thing to a stock list that i would say right now but be mindful that there are other ways of doing it. So if I think, if I bring up, for example, uh, Tuebo Chasse, who is a Danish Delver player, he's running Spell Dancer, for example. There are other people running Third Path Iconoclast. There are other ways of generating uh, both creature and card advantage that people are innovating in this field. But I would say that looking at this uh, version 
I would say this is probably a close as to things like that. I also, with Delver, have my own. So I will actually bring up my own 75 that I have somewhere. Uh, let's move, actually move that apart from there for a second. But yeah, I would say that this version by Soulstrong is the closest one. But I will just, uh, if I have my own list somewhere, I will bring it up. Because I think mine is probably the... Uh, the one I have built, at least in my deck box, is the closest thing to a quote-unquote stock deck. But the deck's still very strong. Yeah. It still has, it still holds results. Um, just be mindful that, here we go, there we are. So if I bring up, thank you, Moxfield. Uh, visual Grid, make this way bigger. Thank you, Moxfield. So yeah, you've got Ponders, you've got Preordained, you have all your counter spells, you have a removal, you have your best creatures, you have more card draw lands and then a bunch of sideboard cards that you can find because you have all the best card draw and the best removal and things like that so that's basically delver in like two minutes um so um yeah delver is very powerful still unsurprising delver still powerful uh, yeah the way i would think of delver in terms of the matchup that we're looking at mm -hmm. is to kind of like the delver in 30 seconds kind of explanation <laughs> is hyper efficient creatures wants to play a low resource game yeah where you just die with your cards in hand because they've countered your key spells while applying a lot of early pressure indeed so with that in mind adek I think lines up pretty well against Elva. Yes, it does. So if we look at their threats, yeah. they're all like these under-costed flying creatures. Oh. We have flying death touches, which is the ultimate nightmare for a Delver player. Oh. Um, we have a combo finish that they can't accrue value from. No. We also have permission to fight with them in. And on top of that, flying death touches draw us cards, so we're not even going down resources. Oh, um, all... So generally speaking, we're trying to they're trying to make us go to low resources, so we're both at low resources. Because so much of our deck can trips, that's just simply not happening for us. Oh. We'll play an ice fang quarrel, they'll have to kill it. We've already drawn a card. We're going to get ahead on resources, and as such, I think we're the control deck in this matchup. Yes. Um, it... Comboing early isn't super important. Um, keeping the board stable and not taking too much damage early is going to be our priority, I think. They can burn us out eventually, and if you just run out of cards and they slam a Merc Tide Regent, you are super dead. Yeah. Um, so it's very much about getting into this control kind of mindset and just then pivoting into the combo later on i want to know i'm saying this like in a super authoritative voice me and sahar are super new to alaran um so we might be completely wrong we but this be. is what our idea of what is going in is and then we'll compare it against a better player later on yeah also um, i've played delva for I mean, I started on Delver first, yeah, many moons ago, and honestly, whenever I used to face Alaran, and I'd be like, "Okay," and this is before this is before we had Oro uh, and Endurance, okay, but it was just Belfast Strix, Cavern Harpy. We could we could probably be fine, um, but now you have. Uh, everything in your deck accrues advantage somehow or another the amount of card draw that this deck has delva simply cannot keep up with um mm. you have to use everything very proactively um and you can you can sometimes take a step back and sort of do the step back thing but i am con i'm very conscious that that you know the way that you know, and I would say other variations of this deck, so things like Team Adelva, so with Tarmogoyfs and like Minskambu, for example, is actually slightly better than Blue Red because you have a way of playing more to the board than you would if you're just playing straight Blue Red. But they have advantages and disadvantages of both. So I think in the if we just take Blue Red as the example, other versions of Delva are available. Uh, but straight Blue Red is most popular right now, as it is, has always been if we look at what they're bringing in 
Um, they are probably bringing in some pyroblasts to try and interact. It doesn't really deal with Aluren, but it deals with all the creatures, and it does deals with all the cat. It deals with all the blue permission that they have. Um, I would want to also bring in perhaps force of negation if I am if, like if I'm really worried about Aluren as a way of doing it. But if it's only a three or a four of, that's also a concern because it's also a two for one to the Delver opponent. Um, but again, I'm not bringing much this person's playing unchained berserker what year is it like mono white died uh, it's like but you're um you know and then you know you can play things like uh so if i see my current list i have you know rough tumble is an option that you can play you can play um you can play narset if you're playing narset narset stops the card draw engine of combo coming off because you do against control same with like end of festivities if you're concerned about Baleful Shrieks and Ice Fangs, but it doesn't really do anything anything else. So that's what, as a Delver opponent, I would want to bring in, is I'd want to bring more removal if I have access to it, uh, or ways of slowing down the combo. So things like Narset, and sort of, you know, thinking, the thinking because you're going into a control role, trying to... I'd say keep toe to toe with it a little bit. Delver struggles against control because eventually it will run out of cards. And as we, uh, Sarah, you alluded to, everything in Aloran draws a card, and Delver simply cannot keep up with that level of card advantage. So trying to slow that down so you can sort of razzle dazzle your opponent with like a DRC or a Delver. Uh, also, the other thing is Wasteland. Like Wasteland is super powerful here. Uh, out of Delver, that is a you know we're yeah. a very greedy we're a very greedy deck let's not as much as we have basics we have to find those basics um so you know if we if we fetch incorrectly uh delver can really punish you and that's how what we're saying about the low resource game that's how they can sort of accrue that advantage but yes it's it's a, it's a tough time for being a delver delver player right now um, okay so with all of that in mind so we've got a brief idea of what our opponent's plan is and yeah. what our plan should be. So they want to be aggressive, keep us low on resources, and kill us quickly. We want to make the game draw out. We want to make sure we get through our resources, and then we just win eventually. Yeah. So immediately from that kind of planning, um, you know, cards in the sideboard start jumping out yeah. at you. So immediately against low resource game carpet of flowers oh. if we stick a, like a turn one carpet of flowers oh. suddenly their wastelands their mana denial just look way worse we're just getting like we're preventing our opponent from getting that game state that they want yeah hydroblast jumps out they're playing pyroblast they're trying to stop our permission they're also playing you know it can kill a dragon rage channeler if you need it to um very very strong abrupt decay it's a removal spell that kills basically all their threats except for murktide and it can't be countered you know these cards really start to jump out at you yeah. once you have the idea of what your plan is yeah. in your head and then also it kind of leans you towards what you might want to take out yeah uh force of will it's a it's a great card but it is a two for one and our opponent has pyroblast very so sad. it could be worth trimming some of those maybe it's worth trimming an aloran or a cavern harpy because we're looking to draw the game out and combo later so we don't have to rush right yeah 100 so we're gonna draw it eventually we don't have to rush towards it so we can trim for more disruption so we actually get there um i'm just writing these cards down while we're talking yeah i'm not sure i want to cut all the force of wills i think i want to cut some maybe two i guess it depends how many cards we're bringing in yeah so let's see how many cards we're bringing in and then we can go from there so two carpet of flowers abrupt decay there's only one abrupt decay oh, there's only one abrupt decay there's only one I, my because we have three main deck oh which is oh. Beautiful for us. I'm just, also abrupt decay can't be countered folks so you know yeah. just being able to kill a drc uh, or delver without with impunity amazing also I, kills third path iconoclast yeah for that. Mercurial, it, kills it kills goif. it kills spell dancer it will kill um i mean let's goif. goif uh let rest in rest in well 
love Tarmogoyf. Um, it will, in Grixis, if you're playing against Grixis, I mean, it will kill basically everything. Death Shadow, Delver, things like that. But mostly it's blue, red, and uh, uh, it, rug. I mean, it kills everything except for, like, Minsk and Boo, though it does kill Boo. Yeah. And uh, Murktide. Exactly. Like, those are the only threats that don't get answered by abrupt decay and the fact that it can't be countered just stranding for mission in their hand That's... especially because quite often a delver player might only have one or two threats yeah at any one time so just being able to kill it and strand their yeah. hand with no threats in it it draws the game out it plays directly to that game plan yeah that we discussed exactly and i think that's something also to be mindful of that if you know that's the way that the game is going prepare yourself to to play on the stack effectively um because if they've just got a hand of permission and you're trying to jam your spells uh be mindful of that if you're kill if you're removing a creature but abrupt decay is very very good one other card i like but i'm conscious of what to cut is plague engineer um because both delver and dragon age channel are, are human um it's a it's perhaps a bit cute i think it is more for probably something like elves um but if you find that you need to you have more cards to cut which i don't think you probably do actually but it is it is at least a be mindful of it if you feel like for example that they're playing say they're playing uh mercurial spell dancer or fur plaf iconoclast and it's not just um delver dragon age channel and murktide and they're playing a bunch of one ones. It's the old age of like playing young pyromancer, play a bunch of elementals, and that's how you kill your opponent by a bunch of one ones. If that, if you see that your Delver opponent is going for that strategy rather than the flying, beefy, you know, the flying people as I call them, um, then you know, it, have it as a back of your mind of like perhaps bring Plague Engineer if you see it, if you see a variation of it. But I think Abrupt Decay, Hydra Blast, and um, Carpet of Flowers, I think are probably the best things you could be bringing in um yeah. and even uh and i think hydroblast be able to counter pyroblast i used to be i used to be a bit like on the fence about it and then i put you started bringing in against delver and you just like this card's incredible um, yeah the so. other thing with plague engineer i think is if you end up with a sideboard that has more graveyard hate in it i like it more mm. um because obviously it doesn't kill uh drc if they have delirium yeah. right like they need to be lacking delirium we've only got endurance though endurance is very good in yeah. these kind of matchups um the other thing i want to mention is pernicious deed yes so that card also answers tokens very very well it's also pretty good against just the fact that they play so many one mana threats yeah it is a bit expensive but also it kills multiple things at once which can be can be reasonable it really depends what we're cutting yeah. so going back to the actual sideboard write-up that yeah. we're doing um so currently we're looking at bringing in four cards yes um what do we want to cut so some number of force of wills yeah i think because we're drawing the game out and we don't need to combo until quite far in yeah it makes me want to start trimming on the combo so yeah. I think like maybe going down like one Alaren, maybe one Cavern Harpy. Yeah. Seems relatively reasonable. Yeah, I'm not averse to this. Normally in these kind of matchups, I am I am a big personally a big fan of just like uh if I am the Delver player, I'm cutting my Force of Wills because I want to play Pyroblast. Um, but you don't want to completely cut all of them because you still have also minor misstep. I'm gonna do God's work here today. Um, so Aloran comes out, Cabin Harpy comes out. Yeah, I think we can cut two force of will. I yeah. think I like keeping just two in. Yeah, you still wanna uh, you still wanna win the you still wanna be able to yeah. uh, counter a crucial thing. The the card disadvantage isn't as bad. Um again in in alluring because you're drawing so many cards then it is in say delva where you have to cut them because you want to be able to cheaply interact on the stat stack and not have to have the card disadvantage but because we're drawing so many cards i am also not averse to cutting um 
Like, there, there's a way where you can... I'm not saying cut... Like, I thought about cutting Asarak, and I'll tell you for what. I'll tell you for why. Because I don't think that's the way we're winning the game. I think we're winning the game by Belfort Strix, Cavern Harpy... Uh, no, Belfort Strix, Ice Fang, Oro, rather than the... The, yeah. the release valve of Asarak, effectively. Yeah, um, so then we're only comboing for value as opposed to being just like a straight up kill. Yeah, especially because we're shaving in a lot because we're shaving in an Alaran as well. The Asarak yeah. becomes a lot worse because you know, bless him. I know yeah. he, I know he's dreamy and he is a five five. He's so big, uh, he's so big. Um, my concern is that he is just a in if we're shaving a combo piece. He is just a free mana five five, which is still very good, but yeah. it's not what the deck is built for to, to, to. In that was in you can put Tarmogo if you could put you know if you're looking at old, uh, uh sort of, soul type bug mid range colors, this is not the card for it. If if you want to bring in something like a Pernicious Steed or a Plague Engineer to do that, but again I would be this is more just a if you think your opponent is gone for a slightly very variant of the original plan. This is something to be mindful of to cut. Um, I think I agree. Just my reasoning slightly different. Okay. Um, our combo, like if you have Asarak, that's just a kill. Yeah. But I think if you loop Oro enough times, that is also functionally a kill against Elva. They can't you're kill gaining you. so much life. You're drawing so many cards. Yeah. That it just become. It gets to the point where they can't kill you right yeah like if i'm if i'm suddenly at like 30 life and i've got the best seven cards at the top 20 cards of my deck in my hand yeah you're a delver player you've probably got like three cards in hand you're just not winning that oh. game it is effectively a kill without needing to be a kill 100%. for the purposes of the matchup so yeah i actually agree with cutting asarak yeah. i actually really really like that suggestion yeah, i and it not something I actually thought of, weirdly enough. That's all right. This is why we have the two of us. Uh, and I would probably this then to what to bring in for that. This is kind of a this is potentially a little bit of a coin flip of like whether you want Pernicious Steed or whether you want Plague Engineer. Me personally, I think I prefer Plague Engineer because uh, it's also Death Touch threat. Uh, I think the fact that everything if they don't have Death Touch are bigger than everything else that Delver plays, I think is quite good. Um, I I think it depends on build, right? Exactly. Like you want, I think you want Plague Engineer versus the like Third Path Iconoclast builds. Yeah. And I think you want Pernicious Steed against like the Tarmogoyf builds. Yes, agree. And stuff like that. Yeah. Because yeah. um, it kills it kills everything in a different way, yeah. right? So I think it's fine to just put down that's kind of build dependent yes. and just like so, keep going. So, so uh, cut. If C, uh, I think we always cut Asarak. I think it's just a question of what yeah. we put in is yeah. different. Yep. Yeah. So then we just put Asarak, and then the plus will be. So we'll just cut Asarak as one, and then this could be. Uh, so plus one. So plague engineer or uh, pernicious deed. Let's put P deed. Yeah. Uh, depending on the build, mm -hmm. and that's and that and this is a thing. This is a guide, not a manual. I think this is something I want to say. I will will probably do more of these kind of videos again. This is a guide. If obviously something changes, and you're in the game and you notice something, please go with your please go with your intuition, <laughs> rather than like oh well the guide says I've got to do this and I'm like no that's guide not well, manual <laughs> i mean that's the that's the fun part of this like later yeah. we're going to be comparing against someone else's guide but that's the thing i feel like if you make these deviations in game yeah. and you have an idea of why you're doing that you should come back and revisit what you've written and yeah. maybe make note of that um it's only ever going to deepen your understanding oh 100 percent. oh 100 percent. i think that's okay. so do we have like a good um do we have a good like Guide there. Are we taking out as many as we're putting in? Yes. So two, four, two, four, five, and then two, four, and then plus one of one of these, depending on what they have. So five in, five out. This is very. This is very clean. I'm not. I was expecting a full ten in, ten out. We've not had full ten in twos and fives. Actually, is perfect because that means your deck is built to beat 
what you're trying to beat. You're not having to like completely warp your deck to do something else. Um, oh. So I think we're about done with Delver. Yeah. So let's let's shoot Delver. When, when you're doing this yourself, I recommend just following the list down. But just so we have an example of a bunch of different archetypes mm -hmm. for the video, we're going to skip ahead to Jeskai Stoneblade so we can discuss a control deck. Yeah. So yeah. let's find let's find the version. So this is um, so this is uh, I would like to respond, Marcus Ewald. Um, and Marcus was actually on the Everyday Eternal podcast talking about this deck and the way he builds control uh, moving forward uh, because he has slightly changed tact on how to build control. Control is in this very... Um, having a little bit of a renaissance, uh, but they're, again, similar to Delver, there are different ways to build Jeskai control, whether you're building it with... Um, uh, whether you're building it more low to the ground, like something like Stoneblade, or you're building it very kind of fourth you know you're free for mana threats so things like narset and the wandering emperor and shark typhoon um and then you have sort of narset days undoing so there's like multiple versions but the reason why we chose this one is i think this is a nice way of seeing control play multiple hats because it can also do the you know it can do the stone blade thing of stoneforge mystic put in a battle skull and a cauldron complete and uh, just kill you on turn three um but it can also play the long game and having heard marcus talk about this deck quite a lot he wants to uh draw the game out as much as possible uh because this game plan is better than anything else in the format and looking at this sideboard I am terrified of this sideboard. <laughs> I am like, back to basics, humility, terminus, every blast under the sun, meltdown. You're just like, I, no one plays magic except me. Um, and so yeah, this deck is um, the kind of, uh, what I what I think, uh, this is a relatively new card star for the storyteller. Um, it's a two mana artifact, when it enters the battlefield, you make a one one, and whenever one or more creature tokens, uh, when you create them, you also uh, put a story counter and you can remove a counter to draw a card. So this with something like, you know, Cauldra Complete, Batter Skull. I've seen versions with, uh, oh, there's a one mana artifact that makes a bunch of tokens. I can't remember the top of my head. Um, retrofit. That's the retrofit. Thank you, Sarah. So this is basically trying to, you know, make a bunch of things. It has to ferry for interaction, then just all the best counter spells and removal spells and, Draw, draw card draw that you can get out of anything in legacy right now and then dress down because as a saga tokens um so yeah this deck is i in all the time i've played legacy uh whenever i play against control i'm like oh god please don't kill me uh and then it takes the mages to kill me but they put they basically are the longer the game goes the less advantage you have and so whilst we, we've spoken with reanimator and delver as us being the control deck we cannot go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this this is built to drag the game on uh and win by turn you know 15 18 20 um and as much as our deck can do that we don't have those advantages especially because they have source of plowshares and prismatic ending to stop a lot of our two and three mana uh convert to mana cross creatures so they can kill everything um and basically have us stuck with no creatures or very few creatures and and an alarin that does effectively nothing so yeah different this is a different now we have to change tact uh for what our deck is trying to do yeah um, my first instinct is that we don't want to cut cut the combo um, and that we want to be applying early pressure and then just go for the combo if we've forced them to answer enough of our things that we think they're low resource enough yeah. to just slam it. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, you know, that kind of plan means that we look for kind of other trimming points yeah. as opposed to the combo. Um, in terms of what we want to bring in, it's a bit difficult to tell really i mean i like like we can kind of go through so yeah. like carpet of flowers i don't think mana is going to be the sticking point 
um, I think we're going to get the time to develop our mana. Mm -hmm. It's worth, I mean, it's a good card for like rushing Aloran, but I don't think that's how we win this. We want cards that actually like affect the board. I mm -hmm. think. Yep. Though I could be wrong there. Yep. Like, that's fair. Honestly, I might be wrong. Um, Abrupt Decay feels like it covers us completely for the Stone Forge plan, but isn't great against the rest of the deck, which yeah. is a bit awkward. What What's your thought on Fortsies? Um I kind of like it, because it lets us know if we can push our combo through, but also like just directly trading one for one with them feels like a losing game long term. So I'm... what do you think? I my heart's to actually so I actually want to bring I want to bring your point about carpet actually I actually like carpet and I'll tell you for why because I think that you you want to get I think here we are the faster combo deck and we have to leverage the mana that is made from um made from carpet uh to cast our spells as effectively as possible. Now, this could be me as an aggro, me as an also the bias of me as an aggro player coming up. But I think that that's how we want to, because they don't, they're not running, they're not running wasteland, so you're not worried about the mana denial. So you know you're going to be hitting your mana as much as you can. And our deck is a little more mana. It's, we're, we're about as close on mana hungriness as each other. Um, so I think carpet is an interesting one. Fortsies, though, if I come back to your point about Fortsies, it's interesting because you're like, what do you take? Because you look you look at their hand and their hands say like, I don't know, like brainstorm, source of plowshares, counter magic, land, Teferi. Let's, let's say they kept three lands, Teferi, and a bunch of interactive spells. And you look at that hand and you go, well, what, what are you, what are you worried about? Are you worried about Teferi? Are you worried about, uh, are you worried about like Sorcerer Plowshares? Are you worried about them finding their spells? It's like, I, I feel like, especially for players who are coming at this for the first time and playing against Control, Fortis is a bit of a double. is is like a skill in itself. It's like a sub game within a game. So if you're yeah. if you're bringing in the Fortsies, you're basically saying I want to try. I know what I'm looking for to remove out their hand, um, and to stop that happening. Do I yeah. think that the people listening to this who are picking this deck up for the first or maybe you know have a long time can do it? Perhaps, and it's a good test if you want to try it. My concern is is that you the one for one is not good enough. I think you need to be up, kind of cards or up mana or whatever it means to kind of you know out grind them effectively because that's basically what this matchup is going to turn into is basically you know exchange of resources and whoever has the most resources will probably end up winning the game saying that abrupt... so, hmm. the thing is i kind of almost disagree with that that's and i think fair. that's why we have a different opinion on fort yeah. i think if we get into just a pure grind battle we lose right they yeah, that's true draw way too many cards like they draw way more cards than us whereas fort sees say you've got like five mana on board. yeah if you fort sees and see that they only have like one interaction piece for your aloran you take it you play aloran you win yes right agreed so it kind of depends how much you're into the combo versus how much you're grinding that's i fair. think what that's fair. is is good enough Whereas my initial instinct by looking at this matchup is, oh god, we have to combo them. <laughs> um, which, you know, if I'm wrong on that, this is what's great about then having someone else to compare to, mm -hmm. is we'll look at it, and because we've contextualized all our choices, if I see that they're not bringing in Fortsies, I'll be like, oh, so you can value grind them. Yeah. Or at least that person thinks that. And if they are bringing in Fort Seas, so I'm like, okay, it's more oriented around the combo. Yeah. You suddenly take just this list of cards in and card out and turn it into like a full context of how you should be approaching the matchup. 100%. Which I think is really, really important. And it's why just having a sideboard guide isn't the same thing as understanding sideboarding. <laughs> Consider uh, consider learning how to sideboard. One thing I will add, though, 
and I realise this. I actually think Abrupt Decay is weirdly good, and I'll tell you for why. This... I think it's great. It kills Teferi, it kills Back to Basics, if they bring Back to Basics in. It, just... it kills Staff, it kills Stoneforge Mystic. Yeah, it just kills everything that you worry about. Um, yeah. Do you, no, it, I think Abrupt Decay is yeah, good. Abrupt Decay is so good. Uh, it doesn't kill the Cauldra token, but uh, if, you're probably dying to this Cauldra token anyway. I don't. I actually don't think we have a way of... No, we don't. Uh, we also Ooh. can't kill a Marit Lage. Uh, I mean, we for, also can't. Like, can we kill... No, we can't. Yeah. No, yeah. We can't. Like, Force of Vigor doesn't... Yeah, it's like this, this, this card will... So, people watching this, Cauldra Complete will kill you. And I'm sorry, but uh, unless you have white, <laughs> this card will kill you. I'm sorry to say that, but it, it's it's so big. It's so big. If it comes down, uh, just it's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, this yeah. card, this card might just kill you. That's okay. Um, yeah, that deck kind of puts us in a little bit of a bind where we have to be able to answer Stoneforge into Caldra. Yeah. Before Caldra's on the board. Yeah. Or and we have to be able to you know, be the control deck. Like, so we have to bring in these cards that um, or at least keep in these cards that you might not want in, like, the overall idea of the matchup, yeah. but it's because they also have this other plan. Yeah. Um. So, kind of just looking at what we want to do. Yeah. Um. Like, looking at the cards we want to bring in. Yes. So, so definitely the extra copy of abrupt decay i think mm, yes um like i don't know if they bring him back to basics versus us but they could we are a little bit greedy and so having an answer to that is very very good i think i think that they probably would i mean it's more for i think we're a free color deck i wouldn't be surprised if they bring it in i think it's yeah. it'll be interesting if they do bring it in i the card i'm actually scared of the most out of um out of this deck is humility yeah humility I... is an absolute beating because everything we can't combo we can't like we can't we can't value combo everything is just a one one their deck is to basically made to make one ones so being cognizant of that it is just a one of but their control they'll find their cards they always do um it's something to be cognizant of that they might they might bring it same with back to basics it's a two of they will find it their control they always find their cards um yeah uh, the question is are we scared enough of all of this to play force of vigor um and i don't know if we are no i also don't just, think we are. just because it's not it's only good against specifically those things, and yeah. it doesn't interact with other things much. If Culture Complete wasn't indestructible, then I'm snap well, bringing it. Get in! But, get but in. unfortunately, it has that line of text. Yeah. So, I don't think it's really where we want to be. And I think um, Abrupt Decay deals with stuff the storyteller uh, enough for it. One other thing that we have a slight... I'm not going to say disadvantage. The staff of the storyteller blocks everything in our deck and mm -hmm. trades with the two of the best cards in our two two of the best cards in our deck actually, actually yeah. as in three of the best cards in our deck cavern harpy ice fang and bale for strix so yeah. but you don't it's strange you don't want to kill them to deal damage so there is an element of the combo being more front and center but that's something to be mindful but rob decay does a lot of work on that i'm also like unsure about like I'm, i want to take out these snuff outs as much as like it's good against like batter skull that's kind of it doesn't kill batter skull jam token the oh. jam token's black yeah like um yeah living weapon it's black gems unfortunately you learn something um, new every day ladies and gentlemen um yeah. okay so i kind of just want to focus on what we want to bring in yeah so first. So try and see if we can make slots for it and move it around. So, you like carpet. I'm a big carpet fan. So let's start with, like, plus two carpet. Let's bring in some carpet. So plus one abrupt decay, plus two carpets. Uh, do, let's put in the fort seasons for now, and we can, like, play. So press many? three totsies. Three totsies. I love totsies. Um, so and then 
then it's... I kind of think that's it, right? Like, maybe Hydro Blast, but it only hits, like, their blasts, and yeah. I don't think that's particularly worth it. No. Um, yeah, kind of, that's what we're looking at to begin with. And in terms of cuts... I have one, kind of... I have one other suggestion. Finish your steed. I actually think finish your steed. Okay. A, it is a catch-all answer, apart from Teferi, it is a catch-all answer to all their permanents. Minus Cauldra. Ignore Cauldra in these conversations, but it is a catch-all answer to everything that they have. Okay, so let's start off with plus two Pernicious State, yeah. and then we can like trim down numbers yeah. if we realise exactly. we can't make room. Yeah, if we can't make room, this this is the first cut, but I am... Um, I just want to... Um, I want to be... Uh, especially because they're on staff, um, and that's the way they're winning the game. I'm, I'm more team pernicious deed here uh okay. so, so in terms of cuts yes uh snuff out is the easiest i think so we can go minus two snuff out that card that is... it's only good against like their rapid stone forge hands and we already have a prop decay yeah um we will... to deal with that. exactly um, so that's that and then i don't really like minor misstep but it does stop like their their removal attempts to stop our combo, but because we're a harpy build, that's kind of the worst way for them to interact with our combo. I'm so, also... sure. It's... But I... I'm going to cut it for now because we have abrupt decay. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, I think because of, because of abrupt decay, I am a bit more open to doing it. So I think I would cut them here. So minor misstep. So that's four. Uh, okay, and then I don't think we need the endurances, do we? They don't use their graveyard. It is like a good flash threat, but I don't want to trim any of the ones that are involved in our combo. And that's the only one that just says, this is just a beater to me. Yeah? Like, I'm not the a... whole point of endurance is to beat down, and all that other stuff also can beat down, yeah. and we want to keep the combo involved. Three, five, six, eight, so yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with endurance. Like, yeah, like, if this was, if, if, if this was a, oh, so, my only, uh, my only sort of asterisk on endurance is for the viewer more than anything. If you see something like Snapcaster Mage or Timeless Dragon or you're playing against uh, four, four colour control um, so with Oros and with their own endurances then keep it in. but for this if you're seeing like just staff stoneforge control uh, win by turn 22 kind of thing take your endurances up but be mindful that if you're seeing things like again I still think you cut endurance but it is an asterisk to yourself of like if they are using their graveyard they have mystic sanctuary for example anything like that where they are utilizing their graveyard in some form or fashion probably still cut it but just be mindful that that is a uh, a bit of interaction that endurance would effectively deal with that you don't you wouldn't have if you cut them so just it's more a asterisk rather than don't yeah. cut them effectively how many cards do we have to this is make? This is seven out, and this is eight in. I don't think we need both finishes deeds. I think. I've, I've actually kind of got a suggestion. Okay, talk to so me. So they're probably going to bring in their blasts because we are a blue deck, Correct. essentially. Correct. So how about we leave one endurance in? Okay. And then trim two force of will. Yeah. To make. Them... Yeah. Because force of will into blast is a trope. I feel so bad. Uh, I feel so bad. Kind when I... We're kind of shifting to be more proactive than permission with yeah. things like short season carpet. Yeah. Um, so I kind of like that little bit of a shift, Three, I think. Five. So one, so this is still seven, and then we just bring in a condition D just as a capsule to all the enchantments. Yeah. I think that's nice. Seven in, seven out is very. It's it's a nice. Again, folks, you don't need to go crazy on sideboarding. Um, I think in all the time I've done my cyborg guys for Delver decks, for Stompy decks, I think the most I've ever brought in was 11, and that was for a matchup that was so bad that you needed all the cards to come in. Most of the time, you are trimming bits, moving bits about to make space for your impactful slots. Uh, and because we're a Brainstorm Ponder deck, we will probably find these cards, and that is that is amazing, which is quite useful because we draw so many cards. So yeah, 7 in, 7 out, easy peasy. 
uh, I'm happy with that um, in terms of doing that. But I think you're right. This deck, uh, unlike other, I mean, if we bring a sort of, I just want to bring other examples of control decks. Um, if I just bring up my, I just want to bring up MTG Top 8. This is another website you can use to find decks. Um, it's not as good looking as uh, as a things like that. But if I just bring up, so this is another version of Control, which is done by Andrew Kadai. He's kind of quite, he's kind of the known Control player online. Um, this is a slightly different deck. This is more you know on sort of Shark Typhoons and Dress Downs and Narset and Defect. This is all put. This is more kind of Planeswalker Tribal is what I call this. Um, and this, I think you probably are still having a similar game plan, but you're probably not bringing Pernicious Deed in. Uh, but you can fort seize this a bit more. This is a bit more... This, your Abrupt Decays do God's work, with the exception of, uh, like, Wandering Emperor. Um, but I think even if you see something like this, the principle still stands. Um, it's the, the, uh, the I Would Like to Respond version um, is a little bit more lower to the ground, where uh, Angelo's version is a little bit more you're wanting to hit your four your four and five drops or four mm -hmm. drops in as in this case to then do that so be mindful of that um and in terms of you know what they would bring in as well like i imagine they would bring in something like same things of like bring in their serenity bring in their things like that but just be mindful but again the thing with legacy right now is that every deck uh, as we talked about when we did our Lauren episode last week is that every deck has variations underneath it uh, there isn't anything that's just a quote unquote stock build you know every version of you know Jeskai Control will have three different ways of building it every version of Aloran will have two to three ways of building it that's just the nature of the format right now is that there's so much diversity and you know don't get caught out by that when you're playing so that's kind of why we did you know I wanted to raise the other options but I think when you sideboarding these cards this i think will still hold true i think the only card i would be a bit cautious of you see a bunch of planeswalkers is pernicious deed because pernicious deed was printed before planeswalkers were a thing satch um but yeah other than that i think these i'm happy with i'm happy with the cards we've put in i think that these cards will help i think this matchup is about 50 50 just from feeling because you have a release valve of a combo and this version the stone blade version doesn't whereas other control decks do um this doesn't have the release foul or something like uh, narset days undoing or hole breacher or something like that this is just trying to grind you know draw the game out as much as as long as it can and then basically win by you know a million one ones turning sideways and killing you or stoneforge into cauldra and killing you and things like that mm -hmm. yep that all makes sense. That all makes sense. Okay, so uh, in the interest of time and making this video actually watchable, um, me and Sahar are going to continue until we've gone through like a bunch of decks, but we're going to just kind of go forward in time for you uh, so we can get to the next step and you're not just going to sit here and watch us just <laughs> argue over <laughs> our choices forever. So, yep, and we're just going to quickly go and get this all done and then we'll see you again in just a minute so welcome back everyone we've done some work uh so much work in fact and we've done a bunch of decks so let's start from we started stone blade we did eight cast we did lands we did death shadow cephalid breakfast doomsday painter death and taxes and we've put some notes in on how we're comparing uh with that so sarah do you want to explain what we've done while we've been away and how we're going to compare it to um someone else who plays this deck yeah so kind of as i said step one is to actually just build and put down your kind of raw ideas and now step two comparison is going to be kind of where we get kind of an idea of how strong our initial feelings were um so luckily for us we've got another sideboard guide put together by someone who knows quite a bit more about this deck than we do yes um, who's been helping us out and so we're just going to look at where we are going to compare all of our lists against all of theirs but for the good of the video we're kind of just going to start with the ones where we're most different yeah. and just talk through why we differ where and make some notes on why um because this will give us a good idea of if we have any like gaps in our understanding that we then need to talk to someone about to get an idea of what we're doing 
Um, it's a really good way to kind of make sure you understand the matchup and you understand your own deck. Yeah. Um, um, again, guide, not manual, folks. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so the the one that actually stuck out to us when we looked at uh, the sideboard guide and our guide is actually death and taxes. Um, as we saw in our video last week, we played against this twice and twice we lost. And I think it is really hard i think this matchup is probably the hardest out of the top decks in the format they just have so much more interaction than we do um and they can take advantage of our lure and better than probably we can um and you know for us we, we valued our fair plan and then the combo as a way to kind of just giving us an out to win and i think if our death and tax opponent plays a slightly slower game we probably are advantaged but if they try to play the sort of flicker wisp recruiter of the card game uh we are not having a good day so for us it was like disruption creature removal and you know basically and then we took out you know one of our combo pieces uh minor misstep because it really doesn't hit anything and then endurance because as much as it's a free four it is just the free four in this matchup um and it dies to everything that they have um, which I thought actually makes sense. It's like for us, because we can't deal with Recruiter and Flicker Wisp and all that kind of stuff, as much as we have like removal, uh, Fortsies can be quite good for that. Whereas when we look at it um, on another way, is that FGR is valued more removal. Um, so Pernicious D, Plague Engineer, and Force of Vigor, uh, and Abrupt Decay, um, with the view of actually cutting the more uh manner intensive combo pieces or the kind of like um the kind of release valve combo of like Asarak and Aluren. Um which is interesting because it's we've kind of gone from like making sure they don't have cards and we can still play our fair game, whereas FGR has gone, well actually you need all the removal you can possibly get so you can keep the coast clear. Um I also think it really leans into the idea of maybe we didn't realize exactly how bad the um, combo is against Death and Taxes. Yeah, and that's fair. Um, so their trimming targets focus more on cutting pure combo pieces and making sure our value plan is as good as possible. Whereas yeah. our plan was more about kind of like trying to be disruptive, trying to deny their value, get some of our value, and then combo. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it kind of implies that we kind of misunderstood the matchup and kind of misunderstood how bad the combo is in the matchup, which, you know, is a lesson in itself, right? Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, so just simply from looking at someone else's sideboard plan and comparing it to ours, we've realized we weren't interpreting the matchup correctly. Mm -hmm. um, we've realized that, you know, maybe we're leaning maybe when we think oh we can trim on the combo maybe we're not doing that enough yeah um because originally we we're only looking at cutting one aloran yeah whereas if you look at um if you look at this they're cutting you know Asarak, they're cutting aloran they're cutting harpy it's a much more kind of big like cut to the deck yeah. um they're also cutting force of will which is something we didn't even consider but it makes sense yeah when you think of it from this kind of like value plan you don't want to be too too for wanting yourself too much mm -hmm. um yeah like this is the exact kind of thing you're looking for mm -hmm. when you're doing this kind of sideboard comparison yeah uh, and yeah so there's a lot there um so there's a lot that we can write up yeah. um so on the comparison, um, we just kind of just want to start writing our thoughts yeah. on how different it is. Uh, so clearly, the pro clearly it the combo is bad, and we should we should have been cutting it more. Um, yeah. yeah, the the game is not about the combo. Yeah, uh, is very much more about our value mid range plan. Yeah. Which makes sense. Like they have so many lot pieces, they have good ways of dealing what we're doing. Yeah. Um and just, you know, we had kind of like decent ideas about what to bring in. Um 
They're not bringing in Fortsies, but I guess that makes sense when you consider the other things that they're bringing in instead. Yeah, 100%. Um, just kind of there isn't that much room for Fortsies. No. Um, the only bit where I'm like unsure if I agree or not is that they keep all the endurances in, which it's... I guess is pretty good against like timeless dragon builds, right? Um, but it also blocks everything in their deck. Think about it. Everything's a 2-1, yeah. a 3-1, a 2-2. Two, two. I think, if nothing else, Endurance being a 3-4, it's so big. It's so big versus Death and Taxes. And I think that's kind of relevant. Like, yeah. I think that's, like, it, take again, take Cauldra Complete out of this equation for half a second. But against everything else, the Recruiter, Flickerwisp, all this kind of stuff, like, it's just... You just go, here's a 3-4. Can you deal with it? No? Well, I'm going to block every creature that you possibly can, like, turn sideways. Like, they need, like, Mother of Runes to deal with any of it. And even then, you have, you know, a bunch of spells to remove, you know, Mother of Runes or whatever. So I think that I'm not averse to Endurance staying in. I think it's not ideal. And if they Skyclave Apparition it, then it's not great. But then at least it's better than anything else that you're doing and i think cavern harpy being an x1 is not ideal like i mean our x1s at least our deft at least like bell for trades with like anything in their deck but just having cavern harpy as like a combo piece is not really where the game is trying to go so i think our evaluation was probably not a hundred percent and i think we valued the combo more than the mid-range plan i think this is something that's interesting and um, when we get to our next matchup it's kind of a similar kind of thing of like we are a half decent three color mid range deck, and we can play like that. But those decks typically have challenge against death and taxes because of their disruption and their mana denial, because they can keep you under. As we noticed when we played our game last week, they can keep you know they have two Rashad and port you basically out the game. Um, so, and as I think both of us have said, they can use our our allure better than we can, which is actually insane. I think they're probably one of the few decks in the format who can actually use the Alaran more than as well, or if not better than we can. Consider playing Death and Taxes with Alaran in your decks. No, I don't think <laughs> that's a good idea. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's another thing, right? So, like, the evaluation of Endurance yeah. and the matchup was off, especially because we were thinking with the combo still in mind. Yeah. So then, you know, Endurance becomes the thing you cut because you're looking at that whereas if you focus correctly on playing the mid-range plan suddenly you're like well i don't want to cut endurance it lets me hold up mana it yeah. lets me have a thing that blocks really well i can ambush the few flyers they have um i can even like cast it through being ported it, exactly. and actually use the port mana which i think is like really valuable as well yeah um yeah like even after initially looking at it, before I was like talking to you about it, I was still evaluating endurance incorrectly. Yeah. And it's kind of that going deep and trying to think about, okay, why are these choices? And what is the difference between my choice and the expert's choice? Kind yeah. of reveals a lot yeah. about both your deck and your opponent's deck. And it's a really, really good way of getting comfortable with just the sheer amount of decks in the format because you front loaded the work yeah exactly right and because you've associated those card choices with these greater ideas as well mm -hmm. when you pull out your silly little sheet of paper from your deck box and look at what cards you're bringing in and bringing out you've associated that information with each other and yeah. it will give you a really good reminder of what you're meant to be doing a hundred percent which as you've mentioned, helps so much in very long tournaments where you might things might just slip your mind, you're tired. You want to front load as much of that work as possible so that you can actually focus on playing the game. Consider uh, consider front loading your information. Yeah, it's similar to to quickly discuss another game yeah. for a moment. It's similar to chess where you front load like your openings and that kind of information. You've already done all of that at home. Yeah. So when you get to the game, you don't have to think about it. You save time on the yeah. clock. That's very important. You've got to finish your game in time. Yeah. And also, you just allow yourself 
the room to think about the stuff that actually matters like the critical positions the critical bits of the game um yeah like there's just a huge advantage to doing this okay great uh, right shall we move on to our next matchup which is yeah. painter probably one of the best decks in the format if not the best deck in the format uh once chaos defiler is on magic online um this deck so i have opinions about painter i think it's very 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 good because it can win in like four different ways yeah and that's a challenge for a combo deck or a blue combo deck because you can interact with most things you can deal with the combo you have a combo they have a combo we can deal with that but then it gets to the like graveyard recursion it gets into um the fair game they have a very they have an exceptional fair game and whilst our cards that are coming in are the same you know force of vigor collector roof pernicious deed hydroblast abrupt decay what is interesting for us is what we have taken out versus what fgr cook out because fgr has done the same thing as they did in, with death and taxes i think it's lit uh minus like Aserac. and they have just taken out minor misstep aleron cavern harpy forcer will and have brought in removal whereas we've taken out forcer will which i think is probably still correct but we've taken out like cantrips and baleful strixes because you know we were like well they just uh, they fury us our stuff dies like you know the the death touches don't really matter um chaos to file is kind of annoying um and like fable is you know whatever whereas they've gone okay the combo is still important but it's not front and center mm -hmm. of what the deck is about and i think you then both turn into again two mid-range decks um mm -hmm. Which is interesting. So yeah, you know, they've as um as FGR said, we're looking to do a mid range fair plan while developing our combo. So we're taking out the cards that are like all in on combo. So like a Cavern Harpy and an Alaron, and we've got a couple of them to still do the things that we need to do, and front loading with removal and like l effectively hate pieces for the deck. So Collector Roof is being a very good one, Pernicious Debra being a good one, Force of Vigor being exceptional. Um because it's also yeah. you need a way to deal with Urza Saga and both Force of Vigor and Pernicious Steed deal with Urza Saga and Urza Saga tokens. Um, yeah. Which... I think the interesting thing is kind of looking at what we were overvaluing mm -hmm. is the way I like to think about it. 100%. So I think they're cutting minor misstep whereas we weren't initially no. and i think the reason for that is just the amount of ways that painter has to get their one mana weird combo piece pieces in without ever having to use the stack really that's true as a like, saga. You get a grindstone in reverse a saga yeah, yeah like we're not suddenly it goes from oh well they need to play a one drop to get to get their combo going minor misstep is great yeah. to no they really don't no. Um, they can always just get it in either through like what's the two mana painter like thing that brings stuff back from the graveyard I can't remember Goblin but... Engineer Goblin Engineer yeah like they can get it in with Goblin Engineer like even if you counter it no. um, so these kind of counter spells lose a ton of value there it's just too niche too weird yeah and you're already bringing in like other ways of like answering what's going on like force of vigor you've got abrupt decay you've got pernicious deed which is very proactive you've got hydroblast which is great you know against the mono red deck um and i think for a similar reason that's why force of will is getting cut though we both did agree on that yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just important to keep in mind like not only is force of will not great against pyroblasts dot deck it's just that counter spells aren't necessarily the way you want to be interacting here. No, no, no. I think you want to have a bit more, a bit more yeah. grinding. Um, it's interesting they mentioned one thing. I'm I'm glad they mentioned this, and I think it's I I've, I've just clocked it when I read it. They can name black for they can name black, so they can put, they can make your snuff outs dead in your hand. So be mindful of that. 
if they do name it, I think it's still worth it. Most of the time they're going to name blue so they can use their pyroblasts. Um, but just be cognizant of that. That's an interesting point. They can name black or things like... Uh, if they can name yep. black on Painter Servant. Because for them it doesn't really matter um, unless there's certain I mean, cards. It, it can, right? Because yep. if they don't name blue, they can't pyroblast yep. your interaction. Exactly. Um, so it is a trade-off. But, you know, if they've got two painters, one of them's probably going to name blue, one of them's probably going to name black... Um, it's gonna be something that messes with you. If you're not dead by this point, I don't know what's happened. If you've got two painter serpents and no grindstone, something's gone very wrong. Uh, but sometimes that happens. Sometimes the painter matchup is just one ones and two ones and one threes, and sometimes it's a fury and a um, and a fable copying a fury, and you take twelve or you get chaos defiler to death. So be mindful of it, folks and just when you play against painter and the good thing about painter is that the community is very open so you can ask them questions um just be mindful of what they are and i think in all the matchups you will see in our sideboard when you're playing them in the wild whether that's on magic online in paper wherever you may be see what your opponent is valuing above and beyond everything else because you will understand very quickly how they play the deck so in the case of Painter, if they're always going for turn two, turn three combo, then you know that whilst your Force of Wills aren't, aren't ideal, maybe you want to keep him in on the play because they want to try and kill you on turn two, turn three. If your opponent is actually going, well, actually, I want to play a fair game, then you can maybe shave a bit of the combo because you know that you're going to go back and forth. You're going to train. You're going to exchange resources. We're going to do a bit of this. You're going to do a bit of that. And then eventually, when, it, when the dust settles, one of you is going to win. And that's basically on like who draws their pieces yeah. more better like okay. yeah so in terms of comparison um with what uh fgr has given us and kind of what that means for how we're approaching the matchup um it very much implies that we were kind of overvaluing counter spells yeah. and also overvaluing the combo um so that's kind of what we have to keep in mind we're not yeah. trying to combo like super quickly so it's fine for us to shave yeah um, we need to do it eventually because Painter has a ridiculously strong fair plan, yeah. but just not as aggressively as our previous sideboard plan was implying. Yeah, agreed. Um, so yeah, like again, we've identified that we were slightly like wrong with how we should approach our matchup. I mean, we're bringing all the right cards, but those kind of suggest themselves. Uh, and yeah, so we were overvaluing counter spells, we were overvaluing the combo, whereas we want to be more kind of like play our fair plan, fair plan, fair plan, and then combo on our terms instead of trying to get there super quickly. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, like that kind of implies a lot really about yeah. how we want to approach the matchup. And I think that's something that for us it's super like super interesting um if we do a quick cursory glance at the rest of the matchups we actually are pretty quiet with everything else that uh, they said there's a few like considerations that you can also look at when it comes to things like doomsday or things like endurance um you know comparing when we because we were looking at this we we're like oh it's good as well to be mindful that when you obviously we found differences but when you also find similarities that's actually a good sign because you're evaluating it in a correct way you're not completely gone off piece um yeah. and sort of gone like okay we've completely got this wrong even the ones for like painter and for dev and Dax, we weren't incorrect we were just re we our evaluation of where the matchup was um was different and i think the fact that we played death and taxes twice on stream um and we struggled it shows that this isn't this is a difficult match same thing with painter match i don't think the painter matchup is actually particularly faded because i think where your opponent has multiple angles to attack you from it becomes more challenging and what do you have what do you evaluate more rather than something else so we've had we you know as you said we've I think we, me and you both admit, Sarah, we kind of thought the combo was like pride of place in these matchups. And sometimes you just don't need that. You can kind of just play this mid-range game. Um, consider playing mid-range, folks. Um, 
that some, will just win you games and that's just as good uh, against some of these matchups whereas I think with some of the unfair stuff I think you have to be a bit more proactive as we said with when we did Reanimator and we did uh, when we did Reanimator for example is a good example so I think with that being said I think those are the main things obviously we'll tie you know we're going to tie this all up we're going to put this into the into the description below but I hope that this has been I'm just going to come into the wide now folks I just hope this has been a good lesson in how to look at sideboarding in a um a sort of measured way for we kind of wanted to bring this forward as a way to for you at home to understand what sideboarding is how to look at it sort of holistically in this sort of three-step process you know look at building it comparing it and discussing it comparing it with other people and view it as a learning experience and something that isn't static you will always learn how to do sideboarding differently you will pick up things along the way the more experience you have of a deck the more you feel it differently and that's that's important and i think for us this was just a nice way of like introducing uh building sideboards we might do this again for other decks in the future but i think alora was a nice one to kind of go okay we have this kind of like you know cool uh, cool combo deck that also has a fair plan how do we tackle our, how do we tackle ourselves against the wider meta game that is legacy right now because it is so diverse it's unbelievable um yeah i want to kind of stress the discuss point actually just quickly um because once you've compared your sideboard guide with their sideboard guide you've got all these differences you've got all of these comparisons that you've made um a lot of them might be really unclear to you like why it's so different and i think it's really important then to kind of take that and you know magic's a social game and not just in terms of like that's where the fun is because it is but also like in terms of improvement your improvement has to be social as well so once you've done this kind of comparison suddenly you've got a whole bunch of questions that you can ask people that you didn't know about before and those questions and the answers you get from them and incorporating those kind of things are going to be the big way that you just get so much better quickly. Um, this happens all the time with like pro players as well. Like professional players, the reasons they set up like these house, like testing houses is so they can jam a bunch of games and always be asking each other these questions. Always be getting deeper and deeper in terms of how to understand the game that makes sense yeah as oh. long as you approach it as long as you come in and you're humble and you're not trying to win the discussion you're gonna just develop so quickly it's great if you have access to the person who wrote the sideboard guide because obviously they know what they were thinking with the differences but honestly i don't think it's necessary you can just discuss it with whoever um just as long as you have someone there, it's good to bounce ideas off and are going to give you that kind of feedback. You're always going to be able to keep developing. Yeah, 100%. Even me and Sarah, we in this conversation, we disagreed and we had different takes on it. And me and Sarah have different types of play styles um, and different ways of approaching the, the format and the game. But I think that that is good for us to kind of teach to you, the viewer at home, but also just to kind of... For us, you know, we keep bouncing ideas off. And I will say this till I am blue in the face. Just join the, join the communities, you know, find the people. If you don't want to find them, you know, ask your friends. You know, they don't have to know about the deck, but you can just be inquisitive. That's the whole thing is our whole thing is like showing methods of improvement. And this is sideboarding is an art form. It is not a it is a learned skill it takes practice so much practice um and as you immerse yourself into the format and learn more about it it will just come more naturally and i think with that um i think those are the key points we wanted to cover today it was a bit more of a chill this this series is going to be a bit more chill there's a lot more conversational between me and sarah rather than kind of just full-on gameplay entertainment uh this is more just like a, think of this as like half a podcast half a tutorial um and just you know enjoy us learning and teaching you or hopefully teaching you some tools and tricks of the trade and uh you know learn a bit about cyborg then 
I think that's everything for today. I think we've covered everything. Um, I think with that, we will sign off for today. As I said, you know, feel free to, uh, you know, like, share and subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, you know, we're going to be making more videos. We're going to, we've got another A to Z video coming up. We're very excited about our next A to Z video. Um, and yeah, we're going to be doing a lot more content. So look out for us on YouTube, look out for us on Twitter. And until next time, just enjoy playing Legacy. That's basically all I've got to say, Sarah. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, like enjoying Legacy is always the most important thing. Um, as we mentioned, everything we've produced today will be in the description. Um, so you have a nice template of how to do this. And yeah, I think the process already works. I think it's actually a ton of fun to do with other people. Yeah, 100%. And yeah, it'll level you up quick. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions about the guide we've produced or just the process in general, um, you can find us on Twitter. You can leave something in the description below. And yeah, we'll try and get back to you and try and give you some feedback on how that works. Um, any feedback, any suggestions, anything you want to see, again, Twitter or the, the comments below. Yep. And yeah, yeah, I think we're about done. So until next time, Enjoy playing Legacy and we will catch you at the next video. Bye. Bye.